Okay, folks, well, today we're going to start the respiratory system. Uh, we'll discuss this for two lectures. We'll be doing this today and next Tuesday. Um, this will be the last chapter on the next exam. The next exam, number four, is going to cover vessels, our, uh, blood vessels, um, blood pressure, arteries, veins, all that conversation, capillary exchange. It'll cover the highlighted material from the digestive system. I did record additionally beyond what we discussed on Tuesday and did post it on YouTube. And um, remember that all the slides that I, quote, skipped over will be, uh, there'll be some questions, very basic questions, put onto the next exam. That'll be a nice little bonus section. Uh, both of the uh, lectures today and Tuesday will also be on there. So you've got uh, vessels, digestive, and respiratory on the next exam. The Connect assignments are available to you. There are three Connect quizzes, uh, and those are all due when? The exam is next Thursday, and I think I have them due Wednesday. I don't remember what time and what day those quizzes are, are due. But take a look at those deadlines carefully so you don't miss any of those. Uh, both of the extra credit quizzes are also available to you. The second one became available to you. So some of you have already started the first one. The second one is also available to you. And your second case studies are open. Those are not due for two more weeks, but those are out there for you. So got a little bit going on between now and next week. Any questions, logistical things for me? Also, it, it came up today. Um, and I'll mention it on the lecture now for those who are listening and for the hybrid students, that on the last week, the last week, the syllabus has it, but it may not be as clear as it should be. And the lab exam that week will be on Tuesday. And the lecture exam that week is on Thursday. It says it. It's there, but it's not maybe not as obvious as it should be. So all the lab groups will have their lab exam on Tuesday, either 2 to 4 or after lecture, and then everyone will have their lecture exam on that Thursday. We only have three weeks. Three weeks from to now, today we're done. We only have four more lectures. So it's today, next Tuesday, an exam, two lectures, exam. So we are definitely coming down to the end of our time together this summer. So the respiratory system, I'll start off with a little introduction. I'll then fly through the anatomy quickly. Now that's what you're doing in lab this week anyway, is just reviewing the basic anatomy. So I don't feel like I need to spend a lot of time there. I'd rather move forward to slide 33 and really spend some quality time discussing the physiology of this system. And for those of you who are going into respiratory therapy, this should be a, a, a chapter that you really enjoy and are enthused by. So let's take a look at the respiratory system. And uh, clearly, uh, if you hear that someone has expired, it has two different means, meanings, right? To expire is to blow out and to die. So clearly, life and breathing are sort of connected, right? So we think about being inspired by something or to inspire to bring air into us and to expire uh, both to blow out and to, uh, to cease living. So spiro actually comes from the Greek, I think, means uh, breath, but also life. So we know that we need to get this oxygen into our body because cellular respiration depends upon it. Uh, for us to get lots of ATP through the cellular respiration processes, we have to have oxygen. And recall that as long as we have oxygen and glucose around, that our mitochondria will work to create lots and lots of energy for us. Uh, and then one of the byproducts of that process is CO2. So we're bringing in oxygen, we're using it to make ATP and energy, and then we're blowing off CO2, which is a uh, waste product of that cellular respiration process. So let's just, I'm going to flip through these slides and, and only really touch on a couple of key things uh, that I think aren't going to be already covered in lab. Now one thing you're going to notice is that over, between the cardiovascular system that we already covered, the respiratory system now and the urinary system is coming your way on the last exam, there's going to be a lot of overlap or really a lot of connections made. 
you're going to see how critically connected the respiratory, the cardiovascular, and the urinary systems are in maintaining homeostasis. So today I'm talking about the respiratory system. We're talking about oxygen coming in and CO2 going out. But on the next exam, we'll be spending much of a lecture talking about acid-base regulation. And you already know that CO2 in our body makes us more acidic. So we'll be discussing how is it that CO2, um, it, a, an important waste product, is gotten rid of by the respiratory system. How do our kidneys deal with that acid that's being produced to get rid of that uh, lower pH stuff? How does our cardiovascular system also respond when we become acidotic? So those are all connections that we'll be putting together. So if you hear the word respiration, it could mean breathing. Uh, it also can mean, though, the exchange of gases between your lungs and your blood. So to have, uh, you know, uh, respiration. And then, of course, you'll hear the term uh, cellular respiration referring to the overall process of taking in glucose and oxygen and from it getting energy. So this word has many different meanings based upon its context. So we know the respiratory system is important not only for gas exchange, but also for speech and uh, smell, right? Things have to come into our nasal passages. And as we'll be talking a lot, um, the CO2 that we bring in has a lot to do with our overall pH of our body, and our kidneys will be dealing with getting rid of that CO2 as much as our lungs do. We're also going to see that the respiratory system can affect our blood pressure. So we'll have a connection back to that. Um, your lungs are making a hormone or a protein called angiotensin II. So we'll discuss how that lung-produced molecule is going to have an effect on your blood pressure. There's also um, a pressure gradient between your blood and your lymphatic fluids. And of course, when you're breathing, you can hold your breath uh, to push out abdominal content. So uh, when you're urinating, when you're defecating, and during childbirth, uh, the Vassalva maneuver, those are all ways that we're able to use the respiratory system to influence our other systems. Okay, structurally, I think we're okay with uh, recognizing the nose, the pharynx, the larynx, trachea, the primary and secondary bronchi, uh, the lungs. You know that all that air, all those structures really are all about bringing air down into the microscopic sacs, the alveoli. And so the first part of the respiratory system is called the conducting system. It's not doing anything as far as uh, gas exchange. It's simply a, a conduit for bringing air down to the microscopic structures. And that's going to be everything down from the nose all the way down into the minuscule bronchioles. When we get down to the respiratory portion, uh, respiratory division of the respiratory system refers to where the gas exchange is actually occurring, and that's way down at those microscopic alveoli. You'll also hear it described as upper and lower respiratory tract, and for this, the upper respiratory tract is everything down through the larynx, down through the voice box, and um, all that's conducting, isn't it? There's no gas exchange happening anywhere from our mouth to our larynx, and then the lower respiratory tract picks up with the trachea and goes down into the lungs. So I think anatomically we're okay here. I'm just looking for some things that are not obvious to us. Um, all through the nose, and this kind of goes through the different respiratory structures, but the nose we know is lined by ciliated pseudostratified columnar cells with some goblet cells. We know those cilia are, are there to move and sweep particles, uh, viruses, bacteria, particulates, and keep them out of our deeper respiratory structures. Um, that those structures are also going to get caught up in the mucus of our, right, of our respiratory tract. And even the mucus get, that gets down into our trachea, we're going to be moving that mucus up and then swallowing it. So many of the particles, the bacteria that try to invade into our body actually end up being sent down into our GI tract by getting stuck in this mucus. Um, there are erectile tissues within the nose about every 30 to 60 seconds 
uh, minute, sorry, uh, there are erectile tissues in one side uh, that will swell within the nasal passages. This is going to restrict airflow, help moisten the area, and keep the tissues from uh, drying. And that's something, of course, you're not aware of, all completely involuntary. Uh, we've seen a cross-section like this. This looks just like the, uh, the cross-section of the head we have, or the, I should say the sagittal section of the head we have in the lab. And uh, what else should I say here? I think we've got these structures down OK. Remember that the uh, pharynx can be divided into three parts. The pharynx is the nasal pharynx, which we know to be the region directly back behind the nasal passages, the oropharynx directly behind the oral cavity, and then the laryngopharynx, uh, which starts right beyond the epiglottis. Remember, the epiglottis is going to do what? When we're swallowing, the epiglottis is going to shift such that it keeps any food from going down into the trachea, and food is only allowed, therefore, to go down the esophagus. One thing that's been a, a trouble for a lot of students reviewing this week is that within the larynx, there are two vocal folds. Uh, the first one, the more uh, proximal or the more superior one, are also called the false vocal cords or the vestibular folds. They have nothing to do with, with sound production. They're simply the first fold of skin as you enter into the larynx, right? Vestibule meaning entryway into. The second, the more... Uh, uh, the lower or the more distal folds are the true vocal cords. We'll see those in a better picture here in a moment. So here are those words. So we have, the, again, the more superior folds are the vestibular folds, and they have nothing at all to do with vocal or sound production. And then the more inferior are the true vocal cords. The glottis refers to the vocal cords and the opening between them, and the epiglottis, right, is on the glottis. So the glottis refers to that uh, vocal cord area and the space between them, and then the epiglottis, we know, is what swings to help move food in the right direction. So if you're looking down with a scope, with an endoscope, looking down into the respiratory tract, the true vocal cords uh, you can see are here, you kind of see a thickness to them. And then the little fold right above it, all of this would be the vestibular folds. So imagine the vestibular folds are another way for food, if you will, to get caught um, before they go down into the larynx. Once, once you get past the vocal cords, there's really no opportunity to catch food because the trachea is kept open by those C-rings. So it's a big, wide open tube, and food is going to go kerplunk down into the bronchi. You can also see the, the term glottis here uh, defined as the space, if you will, the opening between the true vocal cords. If we take a nice look at a colored electron micrograph uh, of the trachea, you would see, of course, lots and lots of cilia uh, with, uh, these are goblet cells, producing a lot of mucus, and that mucus is constantly helping to catch, and the cilia is always moving things, away. So the, the cilia are sweeping things away from or coming up, and it's oftentimes referred to as an escalator. <clears throat> so as things come in, there's a, a mucus escalator that's moving things up out of your trachea. In the, in the lab, we'll take a look at a cartoon image just like the one below, a uh, cartoon image of the hyaline cartilage of the trachea, the pseudostratified columnar epithelium of the lumen, the little trachealis muscle that connects those C, the, the C uh, edges of the C-ring. And um, in the lab manual, uh, the trachea is marked, and then it says in the lab manual the bifurcation of the trachea. And in 105, we used instead the word carina. So either thing, the carina or the bifurcation uh, is where the trachea splits into the left and right primary bronchi. And then recall that <clears throat> the right, um, the right uh, lung, right, has three, has three um, lobes. And so there are three secondary bronchi. Here they're called lobar bronchi because 
they're the same thing. So the secondary versus the low bar. So there's as many secondary bronchi as there are lobes, and there are three lobes on the right side. There are only two lobes on the left lung because you're making room for the heart here. And so there are only two of these low bar or secondary bronchi. After that, um, the lab manual refers to them as tertiary, and here they're called segmental bronchi. So again, there's different names for these things. Uh, I would not ask you to label any of the, the tertiary or segmentals. They get too small. But the primary and the secondaries, or the primary and the low bar, are, are reasonable to label on the models. Remember, next week there will be a quiz in lab over respiratory structures. So this is a good review for that. Remember, the mediastinum is the term used to describe the space between the lungs. And of course, the heart is in the mediastinum. Um, the esophagus that runs down here, the aorta runs through here. So there are a lot of very important structures in the mediastinum. As you go down into the bronchi, the primary and the secondary bronchi, you still have ciliated uh, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. That doesn't change. But as you go deeper, the cells get shorter and they become less columnar. The epithelium also begins to get thinner. And along the uh, tissue, along as you go down deep into the bronchi, there starts to be some lymphatic nodules. Now, the lymphatic nodules in the bronchi are called the bolt. Okay? Now, in the gut, the lymphatic nodules of the intestine were called the, the what? Remember that? Malt, right? The mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. And so it's the same thing. It's just that it's called BALT versus MALT here in the bronchi. And of course, those lymphatic uh, tissues are there to catch any sort of invading uh, organism that could be coming in through the airways. So it makes sense that your trachea would be, and your bronchi would be lined by this BALT tissue. There's also a fair amount of elastic connective tissue in here which makes sense because the lungs must stretch and recoil. So there has to be a fair amount of elasticity. If the lungs become less elastic through disease, that is referred to as fibrosis. We'll talk about that later. But if there's a fibrotic change to your lungs, you might have a condition called pulmonary fibrosis, um, or the lungs become less elastic. And if they can't stretch well, then you're not going to get the air in as you should. You know that the trachea has C-rings and that the trachea cannot constrict down, right, because of the cartilage. When you go into the primary bronchi and into the secondary bronchi and further down into those smaller bronchioles, you get less and less cartilage and you start seeing only smooth muscle. And that smooth muscle can constrict. So a person who has asthma, for example, uh, when their airways are constricting down, it has to be the constriction only where there isn't cartilage. So we're talking about the constriction of the bronchi, or the bronchioles, way downstream, uh, not of the trachea itself. Remember, too, you also have the pulmonary artery, and uh, the pulmonary artery is going to branch into small pulmonary arterioles, which are then going to lead all the way to the capillaries. Remember, the pulmonary arteries and arterioles are going to be filled with blue blood. That blue blood is heading to the alveolar capillaries, then we'll be picking up oxygen. That blood would then be coming back to the left atrium through red pulmonary venules and then pulmonary veins. So again, the bronchioles, uh, getting a little ahead of myself, but we're getting to pretty small structures. So you know that ole means little. So the bronchioles are, are very small, one millimeter or so in diameter or less, and they have Remember I told you the cells are getting shorter, so they don't have ciliated columnar, they have ciliated cuboidal epithelium, and a lot of smooth muscle around those bronchioles. Really no more cartilage, so there's, there's no cartilage, right, lacking cartilage. So these bronchioles are not going to be kept open by any kind of cartilage structure. They're going to be able to shut down, which isn't a good thing, but they're also going to be able to open up, aren't they? So when we get to the sympathetic and the parasympathetic connection to the respiratory system, and we've already talked about how the diameter of an arterial carrying blood 
is changed by a fourth, you know, the radius to the fourth power, and that a small change in the radius can make a big difference in blood flow, same is going to be true of smooth muscle changes in the, bron in the bronchioles. So you can open and close that smooth muscle of the bronchioles, and that can significantly increase the oxygen flow, the airflow going in and out of the lungs. And again, that change is not going to be so much regulated at the trachea, but it's going to be regulated downstream at these smooth muscle surrounded bronchioles. When you finally get down through these microscopic structures, you get down to the terminal bronchioles. And we're still in the conducting division. We're still in the conducting zone. So up through here, we're still not exchanging any gases. Up through this point, we're still conducting or uh, the, the air is still coming down. Now, by the time you get down into those smallest terminal bronchioles, there's no more mucus, no more goblet cells. And that makes sense because by the time you get down to that microscopic structure, you wouldn't want to be creating mucus. Mucus could start to accumulate and could start to um, interfere with gas exchange. So you've got mucus glands, goblet cells up toward the top, down through the primary bronchi. But when you get down toward the really microscopic structures, you would no longer have mucus or goblet cells. You still have some cilia down here, though, and this uh, mucociliary escalator, right? This idea that the mucus and the cilia are moving things upward away from the microscopic structures of your lungs. So that brings us through. So terminal bronchioles, the terminal meaning at the end, right? So the terminal bronchioles are the end of the conducting zone. Once you get down to the end of the conducting zone, then we get into the respiratory zone, and we talk about respiratory bronchioles. So once you're, once you're calling them respiratory bronchioles, now you have respiratory zone, and you're now in an area where gas exchange can begin. And what the respiratory bronchioles will have are little alveoli budding off from their walls. So you can always recognize, you can always recognize a respiratory bronchial, a, a terminal bronchial would just look like a small tube. A respiratory bronchial would have little alveoli sort of branching off from the side. So you'd see these little bulging alveoli coming off from the edge of the bronchial itself. And those bronchioles can participate in gas exchange. So that's why we say we're now down in the respiratory portion. Those respiratory bronchioles will then dead end into a set of little alveoli sacs. So here, um, in this histology, try to make sense of this. Coming down, right, that'd be a terminal bronchial still conducting zone. And then as this comes down, you can see terminal bronchial comes down, and now you see a tube, but you start seeing bulges coming off from the side. So now we're in a respiratory bronchial. And eventually those will lead down to little cul-de-sacs, if you will, of, of little uh, alveoli. Now, each of your lungs has about 150 million of these little alveoli, 300 million or so spread out between your two lungs. And those 300 million alveoli are going to provide an overall surface area of about 70 square meters. So 70 square meters, I've been told, is kind of the size of a tennis court. All right, so you imagine all of those little alveoli, if you could lay them down flat, would create a tennis court-sized area, and that tremendous surface area is critical for gas exchange. Down in the alveolus, if I asked you what kind of cells are in the alveolus, you would all tell me what? Simple squamous, right? And that is exactly what's lining, what's making the capsule, what's making the alveolus. However, there's, there's something else down here. So the first cell type, and, and what we just said, are the squamous cells, and they've also been called the type 1 cells. They're the, they're the most abundant cell. They're making up over 95% of all the cells in the lung, and they are the, the thin, simple squamous, right? So these are simple squamous cells that we've already learned how to, to imagine um, in the alveolus. But there's a second type of cell down here called the type 2 cells or the great cells. And what these cells are doing 
is um, they're, re they're there for repair. That was my bad. They're there for repair of any epithelium. So when there's a type 1 cell that gets damaged, these are there to repair. So they're kind of stem cell-like. But also, they're, another key function of these type 2 cells is they produce surfactant, pulmonary surfactant. And this is basically detergent. Uh, it's a mixture of, of phospholipids and, and proteins. But what it does is it creates a filmy coat, the surfactant does. And it allows uh, the alveoli to stay open, or another way, it prevents the alveoli from collapsing. So those little air sacs, as they empty, they would sort of close down. And there's the potential that those little air sacs could then sort of stay collapsed. And what this surfactant does is it prevents them from completely collapsing. Surfactant is not produced by the lung until, and I want to say somewhere around the 29th week of fetal development. And so really, really young preemies uh, will be born without the surfactant and they will have respiratory distress because they haven't started making this stuff. Their lungs aren't developed enough and they're not yet making the surfactant. What they will do for women who are in labor very early is they'll give them steroid shots. And if they cannot, as I understand it, if they, can, if they know labor is imminent and there's no way they can stop labor, they'll start giving the woman some steroid shots. And those steroid shots are known to sort of increase the potential or the production of these cells to start making the surfactant. So the kids can be more independent. Okay. Um, so there's two kinds of cells down there. Type 1, most of them. Type 2, these uh, surfactant secreting cells that are also like stem cells for repair. And then thirdly, there are some macrophages down here. All right, it's a good idea. You would want some macrophages deep in your lung so that if you were to, in, to uh, bring down some, some bacteria into your alveoli, you'd be able to get rid of them, or even dust, right? Dust or particulates. And so for that reason, they're called the dust cells. Okay, they are the alveolar macrophages, yes, but their nickname are the dust cells because what can they do? They can gobble up dust, right? They can, they can destroy particulates that would get down there. And they're wandering around, and uh, they're just phagocytosing all the time. And this is how important they are. Every day, you lose about 100 million dust cells, right? So they're down there in great numbers, and they're gobbling up all the particles, uh, smoke particles, you know, when you stand behind a bus, whatever it is, right, the pollution in our air, and they're gobbling up that stuff. And then those cells are sort of taking a free ride out. So in your spit and in this ciliary uh, escalator, there are a bunch of these cells that are riding up and if you're not a constant spitter, then you're also swallowing them, right? Now, if you're one of those people who just spit all the time, that's different. But most people are just swallowing that stuff as it comes up the escalator and then down into the gut. So I showed you this picture in lab. Uh, when we're getting way down deep in the alveoli, clearly we are in the respiratory zone uh, when we get about here. So up... This is terminal bronchioles from up there. So above that line that I just drew, that's still conducting zone. And then once you get past, you start seeing the branching of that terminal bronchiole into respiratory bronchioles, and you see these little alveoli, if you will, sort of bulging off from the side of the respiratory um, bronchiole. And then they lead down into these sacs, these groups of alveoli. And you, you also, from lab, appreciate that each one of these little alveoli has its own independent uh, little capillary bed. So you've got this incredible increase in surface area. You've got each little alveolus with its own little uh, capillary bed as well. So let's talk about what's down there. We've already, we know that we've got these little tiny air sacs. Uh, we know that there's not much of a separation between the air sacs and the blood supply. And in lab, I mentioned that term respiratory membrane. So the respiratory membrane is the separator, the divider, between the alveolar air and the hemoglobin that's being carried in your blood. 
And that respiratory membrane is only what? It's, a, it's the simple squamous of the alveolus. It's the simple squamous or the endothelium of the blood capillary and a little bit of basement membrane that is shared between them that holds it all together. Remember, this blood is coming into the alveolus through pulmonary artery and pulmonary arterioles, and that blood is coming in blue, isn't it? It's coming in blue, and it's leaving red through pulmonary veins or venules and then the veins. It's very important that we don't accumulate fluid down here. So in the last lecture, I mentioned how in capillaries, a typical capillary does what? Think about the idea of fluid exchange. So a typical capillary is under more pressure at the proximal end than it is at the distal end. And as such, the capillary uh, cells are a little bit leaky because of that greater hydrostatic pressure than the opposing onchotic pressure. And so there's a lot of fluid that gets pushed out into your interstitial fluids at the beginning of the capillary bed. But as we discussed, about 85% of that fluid is going to be recaptured at the venous side. The other 15% gets left behind in the interstitial fluid and gets carried away by your lymphatic system. There were two exceptions to that rule, though. One was in the alveoli, one was in the kidney. We'll deal with the kidney when we get there next week, but for the, or two weeks. But for the alveolus, what was the exception there about those capillaries? They 100% recapture or reabsorb everything. You would not want to have fluid accumulating in these alveolar spaces, right? It would interfere with the gas exchange. So anything that, that thickens or interferes with the movement of oxygen and CO2 is not favorable in the lung. So again, you're going to have, um, it's very important that we not have accumulation of fluid in the alveoli because it would, as I just said, uh, slow down the diffusion of gases. And that's not good. So we're going to keep the alveoli very dry. Lots and lots of, of lymphatic drainage as well. So this is another reason why um, lung cancers tend to metastasize quite easily because there is a tremendous amount of lymphatic activity in the lung. So if there is a lung tumor, it can just catch ride on a lymphatic vessel. And we know that lung cancers tend to metastasize to other tissues. We also know that other types of cancers often metastasize to the lung. And again, because there's such a tremendous lymphatic uh, presence in the lung, it's easy to imagine how cancer cells can take a trip, right, to and from the lung. There's also, of course, very little blood pressure coming in to the capillaries. What did I say? What was the number I gave you? The blood pressure into the lung from the right side? I forget the number offhand. Anybody remember what I said? What was it? But the blood pressure, I think I gave you a systolic, diastolic number last time. 25 over 10, that sounds about right. Right, so, you know, systolic and diastolic, very, very uh, low pressure going from the right side. And we want to keep that pressure low so that we don't rupture the delicate respiratory membrane. So let's take a look at where these cells are. I showed you this slide also in lab this week, but let's take a look. So. The majority of the cells making up the alveolus, we know, were the type 1 cells, 95% of them. There are, however, some great cells down here, or these alveolar cells, and this would be the type 2 cell. So this blue guy right here would be a type 2 cell. Again, those are the surfactant-producing cells. And then we see here a macrophage. Okay. And that is the alveolar or the dust cell. And those are wandering macrophages that are gobbling up dust particles. Then you can also appreciate that within this little air sac, there are capillaries very, very close by, right? Not one, not two, but multiple capillaries around each of the alveoli. And then here in this image, we can see that the oxygen is going to go from the alveolus into the bloodstream and be captured by the hemoglobin on the red blood cell. CO2 is moving in the opposite direction. This thin membrane 
is that respiratory membrane. Again, it's two simple squamous alveoli, or two simple squamous epithelia with a little bit of basement membrane in between. Uh, remember, too, the lungs are surrounded by pleura. Uh, the pleura is that double serous membrane, uh, visceral and parietal. The visceral, remember, is, is shrink wrapped to the lung itself. The parietal, meaning wall, would be lining the thoracic cavity. The space in between is the pleural cavity, and um, there is a little bit of a, of a serous fluid or a pleural fluid in there, which is helping to reduce friction, uh, create a pressure gradient a little bit, and also prevent a place where tissues um, or where infection uh, can be minimized. So that is pretty much what I wanted to fly through with you, uh, but I'm glad we were able to talk through that. There were a few things in there that perhaps are not commonplace from 105, specifically those cells, right? The dust cells were new for you. The um, type 2 uh, surfactant-producing cells were also new for you. So that brings us to some of the physiology. So let me stop. Is there anything at all from the anatomy to clarify? Anything at all from those first 30 slides to, to clarify? So next week's quiz is going to be a great one, right, in lab. So in lab quiz, it's going to be anatomy and histology. So moving on to ventilation then. That is the repetitive. So we talked about the cardiac cycle, and we know that one well. Um, we talked about muscle contraction cycles. Now we're going to talk about pulmonary ventilation or breathing cycles. And so, of course, we have this cycling of inspiration and expiration. Uh, we do this, what we call quiet respiration, what you're doing right now at rest. You're going to breathe in and out about 12 times a minute. You'll see that number again. But about 12 times a minute, that's your quiet respiration. Pretty effortless, very automatic, nothing you're having to think about or consider. You know, however, that you can pick that up. You can exercise. You can breathe more deeply. You can, you can purposefully, uh, voluntarily decide to blow out a birthday cake candle. So you're going to blow, you're going to inhale purposefully more, and you're going to exhale out purposefully more. So that now requires some voluntary muscles. So what we'll see is we'll be discussing some of the involuntary muscles, the things that are happening for you repetitively, and then we'll also be looking at some of the muscles of forced respiration where you can take in that deep breath and blow out that deep breath, and that's why in the lab you saw the scalenes mentioned. Right? Why do we need muscles in the neck, up here in the neck? Well, if you're going to breathe in right, you, to expand your thoracic cavity, you're actually raising up. Right? You're pushing your ribs out, you're throwing your diaphragm down, but you're also lifting your shoulders, and that's going to require the scalings. So we'll see that there are a lot of muscles that can be used when you are breathing forcefully. Uh, we said fluid doesn't move through a blood vessel unless there is a pressure difference. Nothing is different here. Air is not going to move through your respiratory system unless there's a pressure difference. So we'll be spending some time looking at some numbers dealing with pressure differences between the lungs and the outside of the body or the atmosphere. So we'll start off with the, the basic muscle, the diaphragm. Um, I became so tired of people forgetting to put a G in diaphragm that I've been saying diaphragm more lately, just to remember the G. But now that I say diaphragm, people are putting a U here. So now I'm worried about saying diaphragm, because now they're getting the G, but they're adding a U, and I'm still giving half credit. So please, look at the spelling for diaphragm. Okay. This is going to be the prime mover for respiration. This is the muscle that is going to be um, contracting. Typically, your diaphragm makes a dome. So it's sort of an upward dome at rest. And as the diaphragm contracts, it actually lowers and flattens. So what you're doing is as the muscle contracts, it's going down. And as that diaphragm goes down, it's making your thoracic cavity what? Bigger. Right? So the volume is going up. And Boyle tells us that as volume goes up, pressure goes down. So we'll be discussing this whole pressure thing 
but I'm going to keep saying it as often as I can so it becomes second nature to your thinking. But as the diaphragm uh, contracts, it flattens, that enlarges the thoracic cavity, that causes the pressure in the lungs to go down, and that's what's going to drive the air into your lungs from the outside. When the diaphragm relaxes, it domes back upward. That's going to reduce the size of your thoracic cavity. When volume goes down, pressure goes back up, and that increase in pressure is now going to push the air out of your thoracic, out of your lungs. Now, about two-thirds of the airflow is from the diaphragm, so it's an incredibly important muscle of respiration, quote, the prime mover, the major dude when it comes to breathing. Remind me what nerves involved with the diaphragm. The phrenic nerve, which is derived from which plexus? C3, uh, the cervical plexus, and more specifically from nerves C3, C4, C5. Additionally, there are the internal and external intercostals. Again, you'll recognize these are the muscles you've been asked to know on the models from lab this week for next week's quiz. Um, they are synergists to the diaphragm. Synergists means what? Synergy is when two things can do together better than they can do by themselves. So the synergists are helping the diaphragm do their work. These muscles, as the name implies, are between the ribs, the intercostals. And they're going to stiffen the thoracic cage. They're going to keep it from uh, caving inward too much. And about the other third of air movement comes from the intercostals. Now, I'm saying two-thirds and one-third. That's your resting, right? That's kind of your normal resting breathing. In addition, though, there are the scalenes. And they also are synergistic. And um, they are, in quiet respiration, really not doing much movement but what they are doing are keeping your first and second ribs stationary. So they're really not expanding the thoracic cavity, but they are helping to stabilize your first and second rib. Remember, those are really high, aren't they? Really, really high. Now, when you are now going to be forcibly breathing and doing forced respiration, now we're going to include a number of other muscles, and you'll see many of these also on that list from lab. There's going to be the erector spinae, Okay, remember the erector spinae muscles were the muscles that give you the erect spine that are part of your uh, postural muscles. There's a whole bunch of them. We didn't name them individually, nor will we now. That's why it's AE on the end, because it's a collection of muscle groups, or a muscle group uh, made up of a bunch of different muscles. The sternocleidomastoid, right? You can, you can get your sternocleidomastoid going when you are breathing forcefully. Your pectoralis major and minor, and the serratus anterior as well as the scalings, are going to get really involved when you're trying to get the biggest breath you can. To get the biggest breath you can, what must you do? Expand your rib cage forcefully beyond its normal limits. So the pecs, the scalings, the sternocleidomastoid, those intercostals, all those muscles are now going to go to work to increase. And this is why people can throw out their back, right, by sneezing or, right, the erector spinae muscles can be affected in the breathing. You can those muscles can contract and throw out the lumbar vertebra and all kinds of crazy things can happen from people sneezing uh, and breathing. So when you're doing normal, quiet expiration, normal, quiet expiration, so as you're sitting there and you're exhaling, that is passive, okay? So it takes no energy to blow out, if you will. All the energy was in the inspiration. So as the diaphragm went downward, that was active, okay, and there was some energy involved there. But to blow out quietly is a passive process. And this is why, if you've ever had the uh, situation where you've come across someone who's died in their sleep, right, and then you roll them or move them, they can still, quote, expire a second time. Um, they've already died but they can expire because there's air trapped in their lungs and expiration is relatively passive. And so you can still have movement of air out of the lungs after death. So another way of thinking about expire, right? Now, forced expiration is going to include um, other muscles. I didn't mention the rectus. This is, this is 
sorry, let me go back. These muscles were forced inspiration. I don't know if I said that clearly. So the muscles on this slide are the forced inspiration to increase your thoracic volume. But when it goes to blow that air out, now you can crunch down on the rectus abdominis. Um, and some other pelvic muscles can also get involved in pushing the air out. So the Valsalva maneuver is, is taking in a deep breath, holding it, closing the glottis. What does that mean? Right? Everyone do the Valsalva. You know what I'm about? Kind of take a big breath. You'll, you'll feel your, your, your uh, voice box close, right? Close the glottis and push, push downward, and you're feeling that pressure now pushing downward. Everyone shouldn't do that. Don't do that. Okay? Uh, I don't want to encourage anything right now, right? But if you're not pregnant, go ahead and do that. Um, but you're going to close off the glottis, and then that's going to really push on those abdominal muscles and push things out. So this is a movement um, w during urination, during defecation, um, also, though, during childbirth, and during those lovely moments when you're vomiting, you can also use this to help that process. So let's take a look. Uh, respiratory muscles. Muscles of inspiration are on the left. Muscles of expiration on forced expiration are on the right. So, again, this will give you a little visual. Sternocleidomastoid is going to elevate the sternum. The scalenes are going to elevate ribs one and two. Right? So, again, you're increasing the thoracic cavity. Uh, the intercostals also on the ribs. Pec minor is elevating ribs. And the diaphragm is then going to, and the, and the blue, uh, you can see the diaphragm, right, is going downward. It's flattening, okay? Whereas in forced expiration, now you've got the intercostals going. Uh, you've got the diaphragm now um, ascending, reducing the size of the thoracic cavity. The rectus abdominis is going to be squeezing, as will the external obliques. Any concern about the muscles of inspiration or expiration? Let's figure out now what's controlling this. Breathing is autonomic. Breathing is involuntary. Um, there is no pacemaker like there is for the heart. So there isn't a, a, a depolarization kind of thing going on in the lung directly like there is for the SA node. Um, the actual mechanism for setting the rhythm is still a little bit unknown, but we know that it is coming from the medulla oblongata and from the pons. So your unconscious breathing, your unconscious breathing is coming from your brainstem, okay, medulla and pons. You can, of course, stimulate breathing. You can cause yourself to breathe faster. You can cause yourself to slow down a little bit. You can cause yourself to breathe in deeply or to blow out more forcefully. So we do have some control over it. So our, our voluntary uh, motor system can get involved. If you're going to control your breathing, that is coming from your frontal lobe, okay, from your motor cortex. Um, if we're talking about normal inspiration, we're going to refer to these as inspiratory neurons. Those are going to be coming from the um, medulla. And then if you're doing forced expiration, uh, that's also, those are going to be the expiratory neurons. But this is for forced. Why for only for forced? What did I tell you? Normal expiration is passive. So there wouldn't be any neurons involved with sending a signal for normal expiration, right? Normal inspiration needs neurons. Forced expiration needs neurons. If you're going to be uh, breathing in deeply voluntarily, that's going to involve neurons. But there aren't any normal, quiet, respiratory, expiratory neurons. The nerves, we already know a little bit about this. There is the phrenic nerve that's going to the diaphragm, and the intercostal nerves, amazingly, are going to the intercostal muscles. So we know those intercostal nerves are your thoracic nerves, right? Okay. 
the respiratory centers, okay, that again, we talked about the medulla and the pons as being the, quote, respiratory center or the area of your brain that is sending the signals for normal breathing. There are two, um, or there are nuclei. So let me, let me remind you, you tell me, what is a nucleus? And the nervous system, a nucleus, is a bundle of cell bodies, a, a bundle of gray matter surrounded by other white matter, isn't it? So that within the medulla, right, what color is the medulla? What's going up through the, remember going up through the spinal cord, you've got the funiculi, the white matter around, and the gray butterfly on the inside. But once you get up into the brain, it flips, doesn't it? And the white matter is now the majority of the medulla, and the gray matter is still around the outside. So within the medulla, which is largely white matter, there's an island of gray matter, a nucleus. And this nucleus is called the respiratory nucleus, or the respiratory nuclei. And um, within this, there is the ventral respiratory group. And I'll show you a picture of this in a moment. So the primary generator of your respiratory rhythm comes from the VRG, the ventral respiratory group. It is firing, um, the inspiratory neurons are firing about, for about, they fire for about two seconds. So they're firing for two seconds, and those two seconds are the time where you are breathing in. All right, so we're breathing in for about two seconds, and then they have um, about three seconds for an expiratory or relaxation period. So two seconds in, three seconds out, that's five seconds, right? How many of those are going to fit in within a 60-second minute? Twelve. So you're going, to about five, you're going to have about 12 breaths per minute. Again, that's your normal average number for breathing quietly at rest involuntarily. There's also, and that's, that's, that's being set by your BRG. And then there's the DRG, the dorsal respiratory group. Picture where it is, right, behind it. And that one is not so much um, uh, pacing, but this one is modifying. So the DRG is all about modifying your rate of breathing and your depth of breathing and is influenced by external signals. There's also a pontine respiratory group. So that would be where? In the pons. And um, this one is also going to modify uh, the BRG. The, the pons gets involved with changing your breathing when you're speaking, right? I'm not breathing as I speak to you. I'm certainly not breathing a normal rate, right? I'm having to conserve my breathe, my breath and, and to let it extend. And it's certainly not a normal rhythm, right? So when you're speaking, uh, when you're exercising, when you're sleeping, there are certainly some significant changes to your breathing cycles. And there can also be rather significant changes with emotional status. So those are all uh, external uh, adaptations set by the pontine group, which then go on to set or inform the VRG and the DRG. Looking at a picture of this, it's a little bit small, I know. This is 2214 from your book. So start off with some anatomy first. So what are we looking at right here? This coming up is what? central canal, right, from the spinal cord, and then comes up and right about here, this is all CSF, isn't it? And right about here between the pons and the cerebellum, that space is the fourth ventricle. And then if we keep going up, there's the third ventricle around the diencephalon and then the two lateral ventricles. And the reason I wanted to show that to you is that remember there are um, within the CSF, there's that ischemic reflex, right? So we're measuring the pH of that. We're measuring the pH of the CSF, that, that ischemic reflex, to make sure what? That the 
blood flow, right, to the brain was adequate. There was enough oxygen going to the brain. Now, in this area, let's, let's figure this out. Um, here is the VRG, the ventral group, and it's pointing, it's not as much, it's the front little blue guy. So there's your VRG. The DRG is right behind it. Okay, so they're right side by side there. Ventral and dorsal. They're in the medulla, aren't they? And then this little, or little green guy up here, that's the pontine, the PRG. So the major one was what? Which one was the major setter of respiration? The VRG, right? So the VRG is the major one. And you see signals, and that neuron is going down to the spinal, spinal nerves and is going out to where? Intercostals and the diaphragm. Okay, so those again are, are setting the primary quiet breathing, right? The respiration, diaphragm, and the intercostals, two thirds and one third. The DRG is, is, is uh, informing it, and you see a lot of inward signals. So look, the DRG is getting signals from the vagus coming in. It's getting signals in from the glossopharyngeal. It's getting signals coming in from the central chemoreceptors. Remember I told you the VRG is setting it. The DRG is influencing it. Glossopharyngeal. Tell me about that nerve. The vagus and the glossopharyngeal. Anything about those two come to mind? In a, in a few moments, I'm going to remind you that the vagus and the glossopharyngeal are carrying sensory information from the baroreceptors and from the chemoreceptors. You've also got the central chemoreceptor right here also influencing the DRG. What would cause your respiration to go up or down that's chemical? Right? pH changes. In other words, if there's a low pH, and low pH means what? High CO2. High CO2. If, the, if the central chemoreceptors are noticing that the pH is dropping, what's your respiratory system going to do in response to that? Start breathing more, more right? So again, the DRG is receiving signals from the, chemo, the, from the, chemo, the chemo receptors. So if the pH was dropping, the DRG is now going to send a little signal over to the VRG saying, hey, guys, pick it up, right, or slow it down, depending on what signals they're getting. You also see um, signals coming in from, coming down from the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus, limbic system, right, emotional centers of your brain. So if you're emotionally distraught, what happens to your respiratory rate? It goes up, right? So if you're emotionally um, distraught, you have signals coming down that are also going to, you know, inform your breathing rate. You also see signals coming down here um, to the pons, okay, to the pontine unit. So I think it makes sense to us that your, resp your respiration rate is influenced by emotions and all sorts of things, and also from higher cognitive power. And so... I want you to see that all those signals are, are shown here, wired into influencing your VRG. Does that all make sense? That makes sense? VRG primary, DRG, and pontine are influencing it. We mentioned this last time. Again, you're going to find a lot of, I think, there's a lot of overlap between some of the cardiovascular control and the respiratory control. So if I say that you are hyperventilating, what does it mean? <laughs> right? Ven breathing in so quickly that you are getting rid of CO2 even faster than your body's producing it. 
and we know what's going to happen, right? You're breathing quickly, your CO2 is blowing off. Well, if you're, if you're blowing off CO2 too quickly, what's going to happen to your blood pH? It's going to go up, right? And that's going to cause what to constrict? Normally, right, um, what happens to your cerebral arteries? They're going to constrict. Now, this is going to reduce your, per, your uh, perfusion to your brain and can cause one to get dizzy or faint. So what do we do? Blow into a paper bag, right? Breathe into a paper bag and re recover the CO2 that you are blowing out. That's hyperventilation. What's causing this is a story we already know, and that is there are chemoreceptors, right, that are measuring the pH of your blood and pH of the cerebral spinal fluid. There's a new twist to the word, though, in that I'm going to say that some of your chemoreceptors are central, and I showed central a moment ago in that slide, and some chemoreceptors are peripheral. This is referring to where they're located. The peripheral chemoreceptors are in the periphery. That is, they are the ones that we discussed last time being in the carotid and the aortic bodies. The central chemoreceptors are going to be found um, up in the brainstem. So if you look back at that picture I showed you with the VRG and the DRG, it was a central chemoreceptor that was measuring pH changes of the CSF that was influencing this. Again, if the pH of the cerebral spinal fluid starts to change, then these central chemoreceptors are going to inform your VRG. I want you to think back for a moment, too. When I was talking about baroreceptors and chemoreceptors, baroreceptors primarily affect the heart rate. Baroreceptors send a signal, sympathetic or parasympathetic, to the SA node, telling the heart to fire faster or more slowly. The chemoreceptors also have an effect on the heart, but their primary effect is on the lungs. Okay, so the chemoreceptors really belong more fully in the respiratory system. The baroreceptors are really more fully in the cardiovascular system, but they don't work in isolation, do they? So these things are working sort of side by side. The peripheral chemoreceptors, again, are responding to pH changes of the blood, which are an indication of O2 and CO2 levels. The central chemoreceptors uh, are measuring pH changes in the CSF. Now, CSF is essentially the same as plasma, isn't it? Right? So the pH of your CSF would be pretty much the same as the pH of your plasma, 7.4. So we're, we're still measuring against that norm of 7.4. There are also, uh, affecting your lungs, some stretch receptors in your smooth muscles of your bronchi and your bronchioles and in the pleura, so on the lung itself and in the bronchioles. These are found in the smooth muscles, and as the lungs inflate, you wouldn't want to overinflate them, would you? What would happen if you overinflate your lungs? Those little alveoli could start to get stretched, right, too much, and so we want to control uh, the stretching of the lungs. So I named it to the person who described it. There's an inflation reflex or the herring brewer reflex. And if the lungs are excessively inflated, they will actually go back and reflexively inhibit the inspiratory neurons, basically saying, hey, dummy, don't breathe anymore. So if your lungs start to expand too much, there's an inhibitory reflexive signal sent to the VRG that says, do not send an inspiratory neuron signal. There are also irritant receptors, uh, nerve endings along the epithelial cells of the airway. These are what's going to cause you to cough, right? And they get triggered by dust and smoke and pollen and, and even cold air. So 
have you, uh, and, and when those irritant receptors, what they're going to do is they're going to trigger also protective reflexes, causing you to bronchoconstrict, breathe more shallow, and even cough or hold your breath. Makes sense, right? What happens when you walk outside? Do you ever walk outside, not this time of the year, but and all of a sudden it's hard to breathe for just a moment, right? When you go from a warm building outside, that cold air has come in and has irritated, has, has triggered these irritant receptors. Those irritant receptors then cause a bronchoconstriction, close down the bronchioles, and can even cause you to cough, right? Or sneeze. You ever walked into an air conditioned room and start sneezing? Right? Has that ever happened to anybody? Maybe. It's, it's all part of this reflex. Um, or uh, the body is trying not to get smoke and dust and pollen down into the deep structure of the lung. And so it's protective, isn't it? So if you're all of a sudden in a, in behind a big old bus and it's throwing junk out at you, um, or you're in a day with a lot of pollen, what will the, what will the bronchioles do? Close down. People with asthma, it'll go even further, right? They'll close down and go even further into a problematic asthma attack. But even a normal person will have this vaso, sorry, not vaso, but bronchoconstriction from these irritants. Now, these peripheral chemoreceptors, I mentioned a moment ago, I mentioned a moment ago uh, the vagus nerve and the glossopharyngeal nerve. What are the numbers for those again? The numbers, vagus is 10, glossopharyngeal, 9, right? And I just told you that there were signals coming in from the vagus and the glossopharyngeal that were influencing breathing. Well, here's why. Those chemoreceptors, where are they again? Carotid bodies and aortic arch. So as your blood pH is triggering these chemoreceptors, it's going to have a direct effect on your breathing rate. Okay. Questions? Okay, with the control of breathing, right? It's coming from the brainstem, medulla, pons. It can be influenced. Uh, voluntarily or involuntarily through different responses. Uh, there are reflexes involved that keep your lungs from overexpanding. There are reflexes involved that shut down your airways if there are irritants coming in. Let's take a quick break right there. Okay, so we would say that breathing is involuntary, right? And it's a good thing that it is. We can sleep and we don't have to worry about it. But we still have some voluntary control over breathing, don't we? We can choose to hold our breath, uh, but only so long. So what is it that triggers uh, you to, or what is it that, that no longer allows you to have voluntary control? So you can certainly des decide to hold your breath, right? And when little kids go on, you know, they'll, they'll get all like, I'm going to hold my breath. Well, go ahead. Just hold your breath. Because what will happen? Right? At some point, they're going to breathe. Right? And what drives that is, uh, I mean, you can choose from your, from, your motor, from your motor strip, you can choose to go down. And what happens is that when you are voluntarily choosing to breathe, you're actually going down and bypassing the brain stem. And you're controlling the breathing. But what will happen? As you're no longer breathing, you're no longer expelling CO2, but your cells are still clearly making CO2. So at some point, CO2 levels are going to rise and rise and rise. And as those CO2 levels are rising, your blood pH is going to go down, right? And at some point, as the pH goes down, those chemoreceptors, both peripheral and central, will say, whoa, wait a second. And they're going to send a signal now that says the brain's no longer, you know, the brain's now in danger um, or perceives it because the CO2 is rising, the pH is dropping, and you are now going to reflexively breathe. So no matter what you do, 
right? You can sit there and decide you're going to hold your breath, but at some point your brain is going to instinctively and reflexively take over and you're going to inhale. Now, hopefully you're above water when that happens, right? So, I mean, if you're, at, if you're underwater and you're holding your breath, you can do so for a while, but you can't do it for too long. And when that moment comes and your brain finally says, breathe, dummy, you're not going to have a choice. Now, how long can you hold your breath? What do you think? How long can you hold your breath? Yeah, two, three minutes is not uncommon, right? Um, take some practice, but you can get better at it. Um, this also kind of brings us back to the cardiovascular system. And it helps us to remember that your blue blood is not completely oxygen-free, is it? So remember that your blood takes about a minute on average for your red blood cell to travel around your body. And I think we have this perception that as uh, blood is going through the capillaries that all of the oxygen has dropped off. But no, it's not all dropped off. Clearly, the blood that comes back around is still oxygenated to some point. And if you hold your breath two or three minutes, now what has happened? Right now, basically, you have um, unloaded most of your oxygen. So we'll talk more about that today or maybe next time as well. So we got to throw a couple of numbers into the equation here. I told you and you know that blood only moves through a vessel if there's a pressure change. Same too, air will only move in and out of your respiratory system, out of your lungs, if there is a pressure difference. Um, same idea. Uh, you've got the change in pressure over the resistance, right? Flow is equal to or proportional to the change in the pressure over the resistance. Same old thing we saw before. Yes, yes. So the question is, can you hold your breath longer under higher pressure when they're diving down? Yeah, we'll definitely, we'll touch on that a little bit here in just a second. So we're, we're not that aware of it because we were born into this atmosphere, but we are surrounded by a pr pretty significant atmospheric pressure. And that atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. Now, where else have we seen millimeters of mercury? Right, blood pressure, right, millimeters of mercury. 200 millimeters of mercury around your arm hurts, right? 200 millimeters of mercury in the blood pressure cup is a lot of pressure, and you're saying, ouch. We have 760 millimeters of mercury up against us all the time. We wave our hands thinking there's nothing there, but we're actually pushing against quite a bit of pressure. We're pushing against 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. And in another unit, um, it's called one atmosphere. So at sea level, we're pushing against one atmosphere of pressure, AKA, or is equivalent to 760 millimeters of mercury. Now, as we go to higher altitudes, that pressure does what? Decreases. So if you go out to Denver, it'll be less than 760 millimeters. Let's talk about some dead white guys. Uh, Boyle, we got, we got four guys to deal with here. We got Boyles and Charles and um, oh, we got Dalton. We got about four guys to deal with. So Boyle, we've already talked about Boyle before. Boyle was the guy that said what? Pressure and volume are inversely related. That as pressure goes up, volume would decrease or as you know, uh, volume uh, goes down, pressure would increase. So. Another way of writing this is that uh, pressure, pressure is inversely related to volume. So this is the whole idea, that as we expand our thoracic cavity, as the diaphragm goes down and, con and uh, constricts, and as our th thoracic cavity gets larger, the volume is getting bigger. As the volume of our thoracic cavity enlarges, the pressure is going to go down. We've got 760 millimeters of mercury pushing at us. 
And that's going to push that air down into our lungs because the pressure in our lungs just dropped. And we'll refer to this as the intrapulmonary pressure. Okay, the intrapulmonary pressure. So as the volume, or if the volume of the lungs decreases, now that pressure will rise. So we have this inverse relationship going on. There's a nice little thing here on pressure, a little video. So take a look at this. You'll see this in your Connect assignments. When you're inspiring, when you're breathing air in, um, the two pleural layers have some cohesiveness to each other. Now, why would there be cohesiveness of the pleura? What's in the pleura? Some water-like stuff, right? And we know that water has hydrogen bonds to it, and so there is some cohesiveness to water, and so, so to your visceral and parietal layers would sort of be related or, or uh, attracted to each other. So that means that as your thoracic cavity expands, your lungs are going to be drawn with it. So as you increase the size of your rib cage, and as you drop the diaphragm, the lungs will naturally be pulled with it. It's that pulling of the lungs. So if you're pulling the lungs bigger, what's happening to their volume? Their volume's getting bigger. That means the pressure within the lungs is going to go down. And now, again, that atmospheric pressure can come rushing in from an area of higher pressure in the atmosphere to an area of lower pressure within the gut. And then, or, or within the lungs, and then as the diaphragm does what? As the diaphragm now comes up and domes again as it relaxes, the lungs too and the, and the thoracic cavity comes in. Now the lung volume would decrease. Boyles tells us that as the volume decreases, the pressure goes up. The pressure is increasing now above that of the atmosphere, and now air is going to be pushed out of the lungs. So that movement of air in and out is all based upon the pressure differences. The difference here, though, is very, very slight. We're only talking about the difference between 760 in the atmosphere and 757 in the alveoli. So these are very small differences. If the, number, if the difference was really, really big, what would happen? Air would just be, you know, coming in and going out forcefully, and so there'd be this slamming of air in and out. So it's a, it's a very slight pressure difference, but it's sufficient for inspiration and expiration. So again, the change is only a three millimeter of mercury difference. Um, the vacuum between the two layers is about four, okay? So again, we're talking about very small differences in the uh, pressure changes. Now, we have another guy we've got to deal with here, and that's Charles, Charles Law. So Boyle told us pressure and volume were inversely related. Charles tells us that volume changes with temperature. And we know this. We just maybe don't have the word Charles in our brain. So if you take a balloon, a hot air, not a hot air balloon, a, um, a helium balloon, and, or any kind of balloon, and you bring it outside on a cold day, what happens to that poor little thing? It shrinks, right? It deflates. And then so you, someone, someone's just had a baby or is in the hospital. You go get them a helium balloon. You know, you just spent six bucks for this darn thing at the grocery store. And it's wintertime, and you walk outside, and you think, ah, oh, it just deflated. And you're kind of upset. And then you remember about Charles. And Charles reminds you that, oh, wait a second. When I go back into the hospital and the air is warm again, this thing is now magically going to inflate once again. Because as temperature drops, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? So what we're saying is that the quantity of gas, Charles tells us that the quantity of gas is directly proportional to the temperature. Okay. Now, as you breathe air in, 
no matter what the temperature is outside, by the time the air goes through your nasal concha, goes down through your bronchi and your bronchioles, and goes all the way down through your respiratory uh, structures, the air will pretty much come in up to, or up to about 99 degrees. Okay, so even on a cold day, you'll warm the air up so that when it gets down to the alveoli, it'll be basically body temperature. And why is this important? Think about the balloon and think about this air arriving in the alveolus. If the air was, was coming in, now again, um, you can think of it going the other way too, right? The air would be cooled down if you're sitting in Tucson, right? And the air temperature is 110, right? The air would be cooled down to body temperature as well by the time it gets there. Why would this be important when you think about balloons and your alveoli? Or to expand, right? You would not want uh, the temperature of the air to cause the constriction. Cold air would cause it to shrink, right? Or to overly expand if it was hot air. So you want that air coming in to be at body temperature so that really Charles's law doesn't influence our alveoli. We don't want a change in temperature when we're down in those minuscule little vessels. Okay. So if you were, for example, as you inhale about 500 mils of, 500 milliliters of air, it will expand a little bit more volume. Again, because volume, if you bring in uh, air, at like at room temperature air, it will get warmed up. And as that air gets warmed up in your body, it will cause it to expand. So that's also helping your lungs expand a little bit, right? So air coming in is warmed up, and that's going to cause some greater expansion. What if you're breathing in really cold air? What's going to happen? In part, so that this doesn't become a problem, the first few breaths of really cold air, what, what's your body going to do? That, that whole uh, irritant reflex, right? So it's going to cause the bronchioles to constrict so that you don't have this issue. Let your body kind of catch up with those temperature changes. Okay. When you're breathing, so we got Boyles and we got Charles. We'll have a couple more guys in a minute. Uh, when you're breathing normally, are, is your rib cage moving very much? Rib cage isn't really doing a whole lot, is it? You're really not doing any forceful muscle movement, and your thoracic cavity really isn't expanding very much at all. I mean, you can you can play dead, right? And you, and you can almost be breathing, and someone wouldn't be able to tell it because you, you're moving your thoracic cavity so little. And that's what happens. So at rest, we're usually only moving our thoracic cavity just a couple millimeters, just a few millimeters. And that change is going to allow about 500 mils of air to come into your respiratory system. So at rest, when you're relaxed, you get about 500 mils going in and 500 mils going out. We're going to call this the tidal volume. Okay, I'll put that word here and we'll see it again. But just like the tide at the beach, comes and goes, in and out, um, your lungs at rest, there we go, at rest are going to have a, what we're going to call a tidal volume of about 500 milliliters of air. So at rest, what are you doing? Again, we know what's happening. At rest, the diaphragm is usually sitting as a dome. And it is going to, as you, ins oop, as you inspire, the diaphragm is going to come down. It's going to flatten out. And your intercostals are going to cause your thoracic cavity to expand a little bit. And then when the diaphragm relaxes, it's going to go back up to a dome. And your intercostals will push everything back in. That difference, again, is just enough pressure difference so that you get about a, a 3 millimeter of mercury difference in pressure and that's going to allow your body to bring in about 500 mils of air. That's all you need for normal breathing, normal resting, quiet respiration. 500 in, 500 out, 
How many times a minute? 12. Okay. Can you slow it down? Absolutely. Right. But 12, if you're not thinking about it, you can go 12. Again, the difference is only a 3 millimeter difference. Now, that 3 millimeters, let me go back, that 3 millimeters is marked as being, sorry, negative. So as you were breathing in, there was a negative 3 millimeters of mercury difference. Negative suggesting that there's less pressure, right? And so air comes rushing in. Then as you expire, you're now going to, and again, that's passive. It's just the recoiling, and it's going to cause the compression of the lungs. The lungs are rather elastic, and so they're going to recoil. The, the uh, diaphragm is going to then dome back up. The intercostals are going to relax, and this is going to cause the pressure to change plus three. So now you have over, now that increase in pressure is going to start pushing air out of the lungs. Now that's relaxed. If you're forcibly breathing, you can push that air or push that pressure up to about a 30 millimeter of mercury difference. So you can really push a lot of air out, right? If you really squeeze down in your rectus abdominis, squeeze down on your muscles, you can push a lot more air out forcefully because of this increase in pressure. Pneumothorax, have we heard that term before? A pneumothorax, presence of air in the pleural cavity. What do we know about serous membranes? Pericardium, pleura, and the peritoneum. Do they have any access to the outside world? No, right, they're completely contained within the body and they would normally be, uh, there wouldn't be any air in those spaces. So a pneumothorax, pneumo air, right, in the thorax. And a pneumothorax is when um, the thoracic wall gets punctured, gunshot wound, stabbing, some sort of trauma, usually. It can be a tumor as well. Or if you have a lung tumor, it could tear one of the viscera, one of the, one of the uh, pleural layers and that could also let air in. And um, what's gonna happen now is that that, that that hole is now going to fill up the potential space with that air, and that's going to make it more difficult for the lungs to expand. Remember I told you that uh, the lungs, the lungs are expanding against the cavity, right? They're moving with the cavity. So as the chest expands, the lungs move it with it. If you, if you tear or break that seal of the pleura, then that's really what it is. It's like a vacuum seal. And if you, if you have a hole in there or have air in that, in that uh, space, now as the lungs, uh, sorry, as the thoracic cavity expands, the lungs won't be vacuum sealed, pulled with it. So basically what you have is a collapse lung, right? So a pneumothorax, uh, something that breaks this vacuum seal is going to cause your lungs to collapse. They won't expand when your thoracic cavity expands. Again, what's going to cause that, right? Some sort of trauma, or it could be a tumor, a tumor, something that is er uh, growing and pushing against and ruptures the pleura. Every once in a while, some of you will have an idiopathic lung collapse. They don't know what caused it, but typically there's some reason that we can diagnose. You can also um, have a, a collapse of part of your lung. Now, what did we say about the lung the other day? The lung is different than other parts of your body. Typically, if you had a obstruction to your muscles or an obstruction to your any organ, that obstruction would do what? cause the local pH to go down because of the accumulation of CO2, and that lower pH would cause your vessels to reflexively open and restore the flow. And I told you that the lungs were weird or different in that when there is a restriction like that, it actually causes them to continue down so that you can have areas of the lung that are not 
uh, functioning well, and, and air will be redirected, the capillaries and everything else will be redirected to areas of the lung that are healthy at the time. So you can have this uh, collapse of all or part of the lung, and that's usually going to be from some sort of airway obstruction, uh, not from the pleura. That's going to cause the whole lung to collapse. But if there's an airway obstruction, you can still have a part of the lung that is working well. So what's, uh, what's the equation again for flow? Flow of air is what? Proportional to change in pressure over resistance. So pressure is moving the air. Resistance is slowing that flow. What are the factors that are going to influence airway resistance? Number one, the diameter of the bronchioles. This isn't hard to imagine. You can have bronchial dilation or bronchial constriction. What do we know? When would you have bronchial dilation? Bronchial dilation would be during sympathetic, right? Bears walking in the room, into the campground, right? You're scared. What happens? All those things that we know blood pressure goes up, but also bronchial dilation, the airways will open up, bringing more air to the lungs. So that'd be epinephrine or a sympathetic surge. Bronchoconstriction, again, if you were to irritate through cold air or uh, smoke or smog. Also, histamines, parasympathetic signals. Why histamine? Think about this. What does histamine do? Vasodilator, typically, right? But it's a bronchoconstrictor. So it's going to increase the blood flow, but it's also going to constrict the bronchial, the, the muscle layers of the bronchi. So it's going, to, it's going to reduce the flow to your... So when you're really emotional, is it easier to breathe or harder to breathe? Right? So think about that a little, little bit, too. So think about, you know, when you're having asthma attack, uh, everything's shutting down, and histamine uh, can mimic that. What else can influence airway? Number two, uh, besides the diameter, is the compliance. You know that the lungs are elastic. They have a recoiling. And if I already showed that word to you, if the uh, resistance, or sorry, if the elasticity of the lungs decreases, we can have degenerative lung diseases, one of which is called fibrosis. And that's going to be if the compliance decreases. So compliance, if you have a very compliant child, what does it mean? What does the word compliance mean to you? Listens to you, NCAA compliance, right? People who make sure that everyone's following the rules. So compliance means that everything's working the way it's supposed to, right? You're doing what you're supposed to do. And if you have um, a problem with compliance, then you're not following the rules or the, the lung is no longer healthy. So if you lose elasticity, we say that you lose compliance and the lung is becoming more fibrotic, it's becoming stiffer and it's not expanding as it should. And of course, if the lung's not expanding, that means that what can't happen? If the lung can't expand, that means that the volumes can't increase. If the volumes can't increase, then the pressures can't drop. And if the pressures can't drop, then air can't come in. So we come right back to boil, okay? So again, if the, if the lungs cannot expand like they're supposed to, then the volumes can't increase, the pressure can't decrease, and you won't get movement of air into the lungs. The last thing is surface tension. What cells make, sur what cells make surfactant? Type 2, right, those great alveolar cells, and they're making the surfactant. And I told you surfactant was like detergent. What it's doing is it's reducing the surface tension of the water. Reducing the surface tension of the water. What is surface tension again? How water kind of sticks to itself because of those polar bonds and the hydrogen bonding. If you've got fruit flies in your kitchen, 
What are you going to do to get rid of them? Yeah, vinegar and soap, right? So you've got some fruit flies. You're going to take some apple cider vinegar or something out of the cupboard and put a little dish and put a few drops of detergent in there. And what's that going to do? The flies are, are drawn toward the vinegar, but then normally they would just land on the vinegar and, and sip and drink because of the surface tension of the water, right? Insects can sit on the water. But when you put a couple drops of detergent in there, doop, the surface tension of the water gets destroyed. They no longer can, quote, walk on the water, and they drown. So a few drops of, a few drops of detergent and some vinegar, you loosen or destroy the surface tension. That's exactly what surfactant's doing. It's like detergent. So that means when those little alveoli come down, they're not going to collapse. It, it, it keeps the, the water, it keeps the, the alveoli from collapsing. Again, if a, if a child is born prematurely and they haven't yet started producing surfactant, then the child will have IRDS, or infant respiratory distress syndrome, because their little alveoli are what? They are coming down and sticking closed because they don't yet have surfactant. Now, the other thing that that surfactant is doing, besides allowing the alveoli to collapse, it also makes the water layer thinner. So by reducing the surface tension of the water um, or of the fluid, it's also making it easier for gas exchange. Okay? So the water becomes thinner, doesn't it? it kind of takes away that adhesion to each other. Again, made by the great cells, the alveolar cells of the alveoli. Already said this, right? So we can give them a little artificial surfactant or we can give mama a shot of steroids before birth trying to get her, get the baby's body to upregulate the production of surfactant. Okay, uh, the conversation we're about to start having for the next 15 minutes or so is exactly what we're going to be doing in lab next week. You're not being quizzed on it next week, we're going to be doing it in quiz next week. But I think if you listen now, it'll, it'll help you um, a lot um, as you approach lab. So. Does it make sense to you that only the air that gets down into the alveoli is going to be used for gas exchange, right? Air in your, in your trachea, air down in the primary and secondary bronchi, that air is stuck in this conducting zone but is not involved with gas exchange. In fact, only about 100, of, oh, oh, sorry, um, about 150 mils of air fills the conducting division. So you get about 150 mils of air between your nose and your throat going down and has nothing to do with gas exchange. And we're going to refer to this as the anatomic dead space. This is air that is not involved with gas exchange at all. How much air did I say you normally inhale? 500. And we call that the tidal volume. So if I'm only inhaling at rest 500 mils of air, but 150 mils of that is stuck, if you will, in the tube before it gets down to the gas exchange, then I'm only effectively getting how much air into my respiratory system, 350 mils. All right, so 500, take away the 150 that's in the dead zone, and we're only getting 350 mils of air down into our respiratory zone, and I'm inhaling how many times a minute? 12. Okay, so I know you guys love numbers. So that means that you're going to get about 350 mils of air each time. You're going to breathe 12 times per minute. That means you're going to get about 4,200 mils per minute or 4.2 liters of air per minute. It's pretty important, right? That's, that's your basic number. 4,200. 
Then I'm going to be introducing some other volume numbers, and you're going to be memorizing learning these numbers. There's also what's called the residual volume. The residual volume is the volume of air left in your lungs that no matter how hard you try to squeeze it out, it's going to be left behind. And that number is going to be, I'm going to give you averages. Again, what we're going to learn next week is that every person, based upon their height, their age, and their sex, is going to have a different expected volume going into your lungs. But the numbers I'm going to give you now are sort of averages. So we're going to use the number 1,300. 1,300 is the amount of air that will be stuck in your lungs. And no matter how hard you try to squeeze it out, it cannot come out. I'm trying to think of why I have that video there, but it's there. A little bit out of place. So spirometry is going to be the measurement of these numbers that we breathe in and out. A spirometer is the device. You'll be using a spirometer next week in lab. Um, it's going to basically capture or measure how much air you blow out. In lab, will only be blowing out. Uh, it's much more hygienic that way. So you'll all get clean mouthpieces, and you'll blow out Please never, in any of our spirometers, breathe in, right, is right. So we'll only be taking big breaths and blowing out. And I'll go through all that with you. When we're doing uh, the spirometry, we'll be measuring some numbers. Number one, tidal volume. Already introduced it. Like the beach, tide, tide comes in, tide goes out. At rest, this is going to be about 500 mils. Memorize that number. Then there's going to be the inspiratory reserve volume. We'll abbreviate it as the IRV. So this will be tidal volume, and this will be the IRV. And this is going to be about 300 mils. And then the expiratory reserve volume, the ERV, is going to be 1,200. Now. I'll say it, and then I'll show you on a graph. The graph makes it much easier. The inspiratory reserve volume. Right now, you're just breathing, right? You've got your tidal volume going on right now, up and down, up and down, about 500 mils, 12 times a minute. But you can still choose to breathe in more air at any moment, right? Because you're, you're not using all of your lung capacity at all. So you've got this quiet respiration going on, this tidal volume going on, and if it, right now I said at the next breath, I want you to take in a deeper breath, we can do that, right? And that increased volume of air that you're able to bring in is your inspiratory reserve, right? You, you have this extra volume that you've reserved for a greater inspiration. And then let's just say you're doing a normal breathe, a breath in and out, in and out, in and out. And then at some point, do a normal exhale, and then there's always an amount of air you can blow out beyond that. That extra air that you can blow out after you have blown out your normal amount is going to be your expiratory reserve volume. So we'll be measuring these next week, and this is the graph that you're going to get to know and love. You, in the first exam, loved drawing out the action potential graph. Right? You got to know that graph well visually. Uh, in other exams, you've, you've uh, labeled other diagrams. This will be your diagram that you'll love and, and look at this next week. You'll be tested on it a week from today. Ooh. And you'll be tested on it three weeks from today as we look at lab exam number four. So this is something you're going to know and learn well. So let's take a look at this graph. It's not that hard. I'll introduce some things, and then I'll probably say them again uh, before we're done here. So on the side, lung volume in mils. What this is saying is that that average individual has 6,000 milliliters, or the same as what? Six liters. 
that six liters represents, and all, all the way over here on the right-hand side, from the top to the bottom, that six liters represents the total lung capacity. It's a theoretical capacity that if you could use your lungs at 100% of their capability, you would be able to breathe in six liters. That's on average, men and women, all ages across the board. But we know that at rest, we're not bringing in six liters every time. We're only bringing in and out 500 milliliters, that tidal volume. That tidal volume is in the yellow zone. Okay, so the tidal volume is just this little tiny bit where you are breathing in and breathing out, breathing in and breathing out. And if you look at the numbers over here, they're representing that as 3,000 and about 2,500. So that would be the 500 mils that you're bringing in and out. Again, if time was measured across the bottom, you would have 12 of those cycles every minute. But then there's going to be, so you're breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out, up and down, up and down. But then I say to you, I want you on your next breath to take in the biggest breath you can. So you breathe in all this extra, all this extra from here to here, the purple zone, is your IRV, the inspiratory reserve volume. What you are able to, when directed, breathe above and beyond your normal tidal volume. Likewise, I could at any moment say, you know what, I want you to do normal breathing, but then I want you to breathe out even more, and that's going to be your ERV, your expiratory reserve volume. On the previous slide, I told you that this was about 3,100, and this was, what did I tell you? Go back one. 12. And if you look at the numbers, the graph, it makes sense, 1,200. There's always going to be a certain amount of, of air left behind in your lungs, no matter how hard you push it out. And I'm going to call that the residual volume. It's in this lower box down here. And that was 1,300, wasn't it? OK. So there's always 1,300 mils. Again, these are those average numbers that you can't blow out. There's 1,200 mils that you can blow out in reserve. There's 500 mils that you normally blow in and out. And then if you really try, you can inhale a lot more, up to 3,100 more mils of air. The last thing that I'm going to ask you to know about is this arrow right here. I haven't mentioned it yet. From here to here. And this is called your vital capacity. Vital capacity, vital, life, right? How much air do you normally maximally use in your lungs? How much can you inhale to the most and how much can you blow out to the most? That is your vital capacity. And the vital capacity would be looking at this equation next. The vital capacity is going to be equal to and this is going to be an equation you'll know and love, your ERV, your tidal volume, and your IRV. Let's break those numbers down. What was the ERV? 1,200. The tidal volume was 500. And the IRV was 30, 100, or 3,000, somewhere in that range. So that gives you about 4,700, doesn't it? Okay. That didn't add up, did it? 3,000, okay. Can't remember the averages right now. There we go, sorry, I was saying 3,100. You're right, 3,000, okay? So now it adds up, doesn't it? So 3,000. So that gives you 4,700, doesn't it? So... This will be an important number. We'll be measuring your vital capacity next week in lab, and that is how much of your lung are you able to use? Clearly, if your vital capacity begins to decrease significantly, you're no longer going to be very vital, very living, right? You're going to start having some real issues. There's that number 300, residual volume. What was that again? 
the amount of air, no matter how hard you try, that you can't blow out. So let's go back to the graph and make sure we understand this vital capacity. So the vital capacity then is this volume, IRV, plus tidal volume, plus ERV. And it's going from here to here. And that was about 4,700. It's the part of the lung that you have control over, right? The maximally, right? From your maximum inhale to your maximum exhale. And that was 4,700, wasn't it? What do you not have control over? Residual volume, which was equal to 1,300. Add those up, what do you have? 6,000, right? The total lung capacity, right? So the 6,000 is from very, very top to bottom, isn't it? And we just said the tidal volume, ERV and IRV were 4,700 at 1,300 down in the residual volume, giving you a total, total um, lung capacity of 6,000. Is every patient going to have 6,000? No. Is everyone's blood pressure the same? No. So everyone's uh, total lung capacity and vital capacity will be different. And again, that's what you'll be measuring next week on each other, and you'll be labeling this um, You'll be labeling these numbers and creating your own graph. Now, I'm going to go ahead and have you, just for the ease, I'm going to have you cross off. Um, oh, no. So the inspiratory capacity, the maximum amount of air that, you can, that can be inhaled after a normal expiration, I'm not going to worry about that one. I think that one kind of confuses things. So I'm not going to worry about this IC value. But I definitely want you to know the residual, definitely know the vital capacity, definitely know the ERV, the tidal volume, the IRV. You definitely also need to know this last one, total lung capacity, right? And we're saying that's about 6 liters or 6,000 milliliters. Functional residual Again, I'm not going to worry about functional residual. So I'm crossing out two of them because we're not discussing them in lab, and I'm not going to have you worry about those two. So when you get back to your graph, don't worry about this functional residual, and don't worry about this, uh, where to go, inspiratory capacity. Those are two I'm just not going to worry about. But the things that are not crossed off are all the other ones, aren't they? So the ones that are left on that graph right now are the ones you want to be able to label and know. What, sp what we're going to be able to do with this spirometer is do what's called spirometry. That is to measure your pulmonary function. And by doing so, we'll be able to diagnose some restrictive and obstructive lung disorders. Now, just like we did in the last test, where we gave you four or five scenarios, you know, if a person has high eosinophils, it suggests they have a parasitic infection. If they have abnormally low lymphocytes, it suggests they have AIDS. We're going to just introduce to you a couple of different disorders to get this conversation started. If you go into respiratory therapy or take a pathophys course, you'll expand on this. But restrictive disorders would be disorders that are reducing pulmonary compliance. Now, I'm going to assume that everyone in our class will be relatively normal, and we won't have anybody with any restrictive disorders. If you wanted to um, sort of mimic a restrictive disorder, imagine taking about 10 bungee cords tight ones and wrapping them around your chest. You would no longer, ha you now your ability to bring air in would be restricted, right? So you no longer can uh, expand your lungs, right? So compliance, you're, re you're minimizing your compliance. Now this is what it's going to feel like if you have what's called fibrosis. You can't expand your lungs, there's no compliance. Um, therefore, you can't get the air in. Black lung disease, tuberculosis, these are all examples of restrictive disorders. There are also obstructive disorders. 
and obstructive disorders are ones where the compliance is okay, right? The lungs are expanding okay. Obstructive disorders, there's something obstructing the airflow. So now you're thinking of things like asthma. So the bronchioles have squeezed down. They're obstructing the amount of air that can get down into your lungs. Imagine, if you wanted to mimic this, try breathing through a straw for a couple of minutes. Right, and that's what an asthmatic is feeling during an attack. So they just can't get the air in. There's an obstruction. So restrictive disorders, the lungs aren't expanding. Obstructive disorders, the air is not getting in or out, right? There's an obstruction to the flow of air. Now, emphysema is a kind of a strange combination of the two. So I, I want to be very clear that emphysema, I am not including under obstructive. I'm calling it its own separate category because it has characteristics of both obstructive and restrictive. So if I ask you on an exam or in the lab, give me an example of an obstructive disorder, you're all going to tell me asthma or chronic bronchitis, inflammation of the bronchi, airflow problems. If I asked you, give me an example of restrictive disorders, the previous one, you're going to tell me this disease called pulmonary fibrosis or black lung disease or TB. Those would be the examples we'll use. I want to get through this. This will be my last slide right here because it talks about a couple more values, and then we'll shut this off. Uh, we'll pick this up next time. I'll start off by going over these numbers again. By then, some of you will have already been in lab next Tuesday afternoon. You've already played with this. Others of you will play with these values next week in lab as well. Um, for those people who have lab next Thursday, you're going to want to go back and maybe even look through the lab in advance because you're not going to have the lab experience until the day of the exam. Uh, for my hybrid students who are listening, I would recommend um, that you wait until after next Thursday night's exam, sorry, next Thursday night's lab, and then take the exam on Friday because I'd really like you to have had the laboratory experience before you take the exam. The Thursday afternoon folks, You'll, you'll see that in lab, it'll all make sense. So you're leaving lab, it'll all make good sense to you, and then you'll walk into the exam. But for the hybrid students who are listening, I would definitely recommend don't take it on Thursday. Wait till after you've done the lab Thursday night, and then take the exam on Friday. So the last number I'm going to mention is forced expiratory volume. This will be a big part of our lab next week. It's abbreviated FEV or FEV subscript 1. And what this is saying is how much of your air can you blow out in one second? And when you go in for a pulmonary functions test, if you've had asthma or bronchitis, um, you're going to go into the clinic, they're going to put this mouthpiece on you, they may even pinch your nose, and they're going to say, okay, take the biggest breath you can, and then whoo, blow that air out as forcefully and as quickly as you can. And the computer is measuring this, this amount. A normal person should be able to blow out between 75 and 85% of all their air in one second. But what if you have asthma? What if you have an, obs an obstructive disorder? If you're blowing out through a straw, then you're not going to be able to get out as much of that air in one blow, will you, in one second. So a person who has an obstructive disorder would have a low FEV1. And I'll go back and put that under there. So for obstructive disorders, they're going to have a low FEV1. And we'll talk about that in lab next week. And finally, uh, peak flow. You'll be measuring just the speed of expiration. Uh, we'll be looking at that in lab a little bit. And then you also could describe your minute respiratory volume. That is, how much air are you breathing in and out every minute? Will you tell me? At rest, you're normally breathing in 500 mils every time. We're normally doing 12 breaths per minute. So what does that give us? 6,000, or 6 liters. And then um, maximum voluntary ventilation. Um, 
that is when you're exercising or, or straining and you've really, really got your lungs going, how much can you get in there? You can actually have as much as 120 to 150, even 170 liters per minute of air going in and out of your lungs. At rest, it's only six liters. Under maximum exercise, it can really go up. So we'll stop there and we'll pick up with this conversation over the lab values and continue and finish the respiratory system next week. Go ahead and don't forget to be doing your connect assignments. And I don't want to see anybody at the end of the semester lose points. I want to see everyone get 30 out of 30. So make sure you're doing all of your connect assignments to at least an 80% uh, mastery. And then don't forget there are three quizzes out there. And you can certainly go ahead and do the digestive and the vessel quiz. And you might want to at least click on the respiratory quiz, but I wouldn't finish it until we finish our conversation next Tuesday.